I'm going to say a prayer. Today I'm speaking in line with what we were just studying, and I'm going to be saying a prayer. And we were just studying on prophecy, and that is what I will be continuing to talk about, specifically the book of Revelation. Revelation uh, 13. Revelation 13 is going to be the focus today. And I will be dealing with a number of topics, and one of them in particular is the unity of the Holy Spirit. So we can keep in mind Revelation 13, also, also Ephesians 4. Revelation 13, 13 is uh, one of the main areas I'll be focusing. And also Ephesians 4, dealing with the end times and dealing with the unity, the true unity of the Spirit. I'm going to say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, uh, for this Sabbath day, for this time. I want to th thank you, Lord. It is a time uh, for us to turn our minds to you, Lord. As one of the songs, one of the hymns says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So we want to take a minute now to pause, as uh, this is the time for us to pause and to keep our minds stayed upon you, to keep our minds stayed upon you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your guidance. And we pray, Lord, that as we explore these topics today, the topics of Revelation 13, of unity, unity of the Spirit. Help us to apply these lessons to our lives. Help us to be encouraged and strengthened. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So today I'm going to be exploring some of the topics. And there's a lot of things that I'm going to be saying and I've spoken on much of this before. And anybody who's seen previous sermons or messages of mine or have engaged in Bible studies with me will know where I'm coming from so that I may say certain things and speak in a broad sense because I think it might be too tedious to go into all of the details but I have spoken on all of these things before. And I invite you also to study these matters because God's people must understand prophecy. The book of Revelation is called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. If we want to understand the gospel, if we want to truly understand the gospel, we must understand prophecy. We, we, cannot, we cannot avoid the study of prophecy. We cannot avoid the, the study of the heavenly sanctuary to understand who is the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. If we don't understand these things, we're not going to have a full understanding of the gospel. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, verse 105, that the word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So God has given us his word to enlighten us. God has given us his word to guide us. Now, in prophecy, we read something very interesting, and I'm going to read it right now. I mentioned Revelation. Revelation 13, and I want to go to Revelation 13, verse 6, and it says here, well, not verse 6, verse 16, Revelation 13 and verse 16, and what does it say here? He causes all, 
all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their hand or on their foreheads. You know, my daughter asked me, I, uh, can you speak about Revelation? Can you, I want to know about what is going to happen. What is going to happen in this world? Now, I'm going to speak on that, but as I said, I don't want to overwhelm the saints, and I know many of you know the details behind, the details that build up many of the statements that I'm making. And I'm making, in, in many senses, very general statements. And I guess many who have studied these things, and there are great opportunities to study these, and great resources to study prophecy, a lot of resources, um, Doug Batchelor has resources, amazing facts, a very special book if you want to know prophecy, The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. Study, study, study. I can't study for you. And in a, a message that's only, what, a half hour or 45 minutes, we can't go into all of the details. But if we are called by God to look at what's going on in the world through biblical lenses, then we have to study the Word of God. And we have to understand prophecy. And where are things going in this world? What is going to happen? Now, you all understand the turmoils of the age, the turmoils of the time. The question is, where are things going? What are we to expect? And what we see here in Revelation 13 and verse 16, he causes all. Well, let's back up a little bit. Who causes all? Now, understanding Revelation, the book of Revelation, you got to understand the book of Daniel. Again, a very general statement. Any Adventist understands it. You want to understand Revelation, got to understand Daniel. Revelation 13 talks of beasts. There are two beasts mentioned. There's the beast of the sea, and there's the beast of the land. There are two beasts. How many? Two. If you can count one to two, you can remember that there are two beasts. And if you can remember, one is of the land, one is of the sea. The first is of the sea, the second is of the land. Now, in order to understand beasts in prophecy, again, you have to understand Daniel. Now, I don't want to overwhelm you, so I'll just mention Daniel chapter 7. you got to understand Daniel chapter 7, which talks about beasts. And in that chapter, it reveals that beasts are kings and beasts are kingdoms. So king, in this prophetic context, is synonymous with kingdom. Again, Daniel chapter 7. And you could look at verses like 17 and 23. But Daniel chapter 7. Now, Revelation mentions this beast of the sea. Who is this beast of the sea? Again, let us remind ourselves that we have to study these things. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, you got to go back and study. you got to study. So I'm making a very general statement. The Bible, in the book of Daniel, points to four beasts, four kingdoms. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Okay, four beasts, four kingdoms. In Daniel chapter 2, they are signified as metals. In Daniel chapter 7, they are signified as beasts. And the Bible reveals what they are. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. And then the New Testament kingdom is Rome. So obviously that's the fourth kingdom. Daniel actually reveals in Daniel chapter 8, with different symbols, but Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 and 21, names two of the kingdoms. Daniel chapter 8, 20 and 21. And Daniel chapter 2 makes very clear what the first kingdom was. Because it was King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the great Nebuchadnezzar. And he had that dream. He had a dream. And in the dream, 
he saw an image. And the image had a head of gold, chest of silver, thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron mixed with clay. He didn't understand what it mean. He, it meant Daniel was sent by God to give him understanding of that vision. And Daniel revealed to him, these are kingdoms, and the first kingdom is your kingdom, which is Babylon. The next kingdom, Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia. Also in Daniel chapter 5, Medo-Persia ended up taking over and conquering Babylon. The next kingdom after that, as I mentioned already in Daniel chapter 8, the verses I mentioned in Daniel chapter 8, 20 and 21, which kingdom defeated Medo-Persia? Study history. But it tells us right there in the Bible, Greece, and then the kingdom of the New Testament, Rome. So the Bible is showing us these kingdoms. But out of that fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7 came ten kings or ten kingdoms. Kingdoms, divided kingdoms, came out of Rome. And among those divided kingdoms came a strange kingdom, a spiritual kingdom with spiritual pursuits symbolized as a horn, one of the horns, but a strange little horn with eyes and a mouth and a blasphemous kingdom with spiritual pursuits, a church kingdom, a Roman church kingdom. Yes, because it came out of Rome, obviously. Well, now going to Revelation and I had to say all that quickly, again, study these things out. So when we go to Revelation 13, we see a beast. And that beast has the imagery of Daniel chapter 7. It has features of the bear. It has features of the lion. It has features of the leopard. It has features of that final beast that represents Rome. It has those features and it has the spiritual interest to attack God, to attack his sanctuary, to blaspheme his name. What could that kingdom, what is that church kingdom that came out after the Roman Empire was divided up, which by the way, we know who have studied, that is talking about the beginning of Europe, the beginning of modern Europe. Okay. Well, Rome was the, the, the beginning of the division of the Western Roman Empire, 476, and 476 AD. That was when the beginnings of modern Europe began, 476 AD. We begin to enter into the Dark Ages, and there was a church kingdom that gained a monopoly in Europe the Roman church, the Roman church. The, and so what was that church? Well, let's step back a minute. What church came out of Rome? What church gained a monopoly over Europe? What church system gained that monopoly? And just putting two and two together, we can very clearly determine what it was. Now, according to the study of scripture, According to what we study, this beast, this kingdom, would continue for a time, times, and half time. A time, times, and half time. Or a year, two years, and half a year. And that's Daniel 7.25, a time, times, and half time. Now, Revelation 11, Revelation 12, Revelation 13 all speak about that period of time. But without getting into all of that, because again, I know this is a very complex matter. I'll just say it very clearly. The Bible is saying that this Roman ecclesiastical kingdom, which gained authority and rose up during that period of time, when we enter into the Dark Ages, this ecclesiastical authority um, received a deadly wound. Now, in the book of Revelation 13, it tells us about a deadly wound that was healed on that beast. Now, that beast, that first beast, let's think about this. We're talking about Revelation 13 now. That first beast that comes out of the sea, that has those features that remind us of those four beasts in Daniel, 
that had a deadly wound that had healed, that has ecclesiastical pursuits, and that ruled for a certain period of time, and according to Revelation 13 and verse 5, 42 months, 1,260 days. 1,260 days. Well, let's think for a minute here. This, this kingdom is ruling for a certain period of time and then receives a deadly wound. According to Revelation 13, the beast, there is captivity language. Let's read Revelation 13. There is captivity language now. Verse 9 and 10, Revelation 13, 9 and 10. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. So we have a reference of a time when the beast would go into captivity. My, 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 wow. You know, some people say, why couldn't God make it all simple? Why couldn't he just say it out? God wants you to study the scripture, saint. God wants you to study the scripture. That's why we are called to study the scripture. There are certain things that we're not to know right at the beginning. You know, when you read the Bible, there are certain lessons you can get them right away. You read, for example, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Get that right away. But then when you read Revelation, you got to study more. When you read about the love of God and you understand Jesus and the basics of the gospel, the rudimentaries, God has given the word to us so that some things we can clearly read and understand, but then we graduate to the next level. You see, this is like a curriculum. That's what the Bible is. It is a, it is a universe. It's, it's like a, a university full of textbooks written by the prophets. And certain areas of scripture are, are to be st understood when you are more advanced. So, and I kind of think that just as a good school teacher doesn't give you calculus in first grade, God has arranged his word so that through the leading of the Spirit, we go from one lesson to the next. And now we're studying a very advanced lesson. And that's why I'm saying, if you don't understand these things, and I'm trying to make them simple, and that's one of the reasons I'm not going into all the details to back up everything that I'm saying here. But let us just very clearly say that that beast of Revelation 13 is has the same character and the same interests and therefore is the very same the very same entity, the very same institution, the very same kingdom as that little horn in Daniel chapter 7 and also mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. Okay, that came out of Rome. Same, an ecclesiastical church kingdom, and we are obviously talking about the papal kingdom, the papal phase of Rome. See, we have the pagan phase of Rome, and then we have the papal phase of Rome. There were two phases. Just as the little horn is shown in Daniel chapter 8 now, I talked about the little horn in Daniel 7, the little horn in Daniel 8 has two phases. You read in Daniel 8, verse 8 and 9, we read about the horizontal phase, the horizontal, you know, the temporal horizontal phase of that kingdom. But then we read of the vertical the spiritual phase, the spiritual pursuits, the papal phase of Rome. See, Rome has two phases. The Roman kingdom is now in the papal phase. We are living in the days of the papal phase, but there was a deadly wound. When did it happen? When was the deadly wound? When did this captivity that we see referenced, when did that happen? When? We want to know. God's student must be able to know from looking at history. When? Well, when did this captivity of Revelation 13, 10 happen? 1798. 1798. The eldest daughter of the Roman Catholic Church was France. The eldest daughter of the Roman Catholic Church was the Franks. It was Clovis, king of the Franks, who became Roman Catholic 496 A.D. 
joining his power with that of the church. And that was a major point. You know, his conversion, as I mentioned, 496. And then later on, what did Clovis and the Frankish kingdom do? The Frankish kingdom, which would later become the basis for the French kingdom. What did they do? They went to war against the enemies. They went to war against the Visigoths, who were, at that time were not Catholic. They went to war. Uh, and Clovis received political honor. 508. So 508, when that political union now is solidified. 508, very important for the establishment of this spiritual monopoly. We're talking about a spiritual monopoly in Europe. And it was, during the Dark Ages, a Roman monopoly. A Roman ecclesiastical, the church of Europe, the dominant church, the dominant spiritual force. That's what we're talking about. But what happened in 1798? The armies of Napoleon, led by Berthier, took Pope Pius VI prisoner, and he died a year later. Wow. A death blow. He was taken into captivity. The Pope, the leader of that ecclesiastical kingdom. But the Bible tells us the wound would be healed. And since those days, since those days, this papal Roman kingdom has been rising up. And now we're in a time where, now we're in a time where we have a pope in place who is really making his presence known in some interesting ways. Study, look at, look at what's going on in the news, but look at the Pope. Now, as I mentioned, 1798. You know, 1798 was really, as far as the Roman Catholic Church was concerned, the culmination, the culmination of something that had, that had, had occurred. The French Revolution, which started 1789. So 1789 was really the beginning of the end, at least for a time, because it led to this deadly wound. It led to this deadly wound. But what is interesting is that 1789 is also when another kingdom was emerging. 1789 was when America put its constitution into effect. And what do we read right after reading about that captivity? What do we read in Revelation 13, 11? The beast of the land rising up. And this is a beast with economic world power. Because what we see in Revelation 13 is a union develop between the beast of the land and what other beast could have been that was rising up at the time when this deadly wound occurred? None other than America. With economic world power, none other than America. A lamb-like beast, when we think of lamb, what do we think of? We think of Jesus. We think of the Lamb of God. A beast with lamb-like horns. There is a lamb-like power to this beast. Two horns. Horns also represent power and authorities. A lamb-like beast. A beast with a Christian character. And you know, America was largely started. I don't know if you realize it, but I believe those who've been studying this do understand that people came here looking for religious freedom. Pilgrims, separatists, uh, Puritans, uh, uh, um, Calvinists, um, Quakers even, Quakers, uh, Lutherans. People came to America it was largely a church relocation project. Now, I'm not saying they came only for these reasons. There were some were looking for money. There were some were looking for wealth and all of these things. But there were, it was largely a, a church relocation. And so when we see the language, Revelation is telling us like a lamb. There's something about that beast like a lamb. But it says, spoke as a dragon. Let me read you this. Revelation 13 and verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Well, the Bible is telling us that eventually something will 
happen. There's going to be a union. And as we read Revelation 13, we then see this union develop between these two beasts, these two strange kingdoms. And it's not only between the two of them, because if we look back at Revelation 13 and verse 2, Revelation 13 and verse 2 tells us about somebody else in the picture, a dragon. And in Revelation, the dragon is the devil. So he's going to be this threefold union that develops. Now, Let's, let's think of what's going on in the world. We see these protests. We see looting. We see riots. We see unrest. We see COVID-19. We see a lot of things. What does the dragon have in store for us? What will happen to God's people? Where are things heading? Are we going to be able, as God's people, to recognize the signs of the time? What does the book of Revelation say to us? There is going to be a union. So what, when you see the President of the United States, when you see the President of the United States joining with the Pope, when you see that happening, when you see this clear union develop between the President of the United States, remember I said beast is synonymous with king or ruler and kingdom. You see the President of the United States joining with the Pope. The Bible is saying that's going to happen. Think of the two of them shaking hands. Think of the two joining together. Let us continue to see what will happen and what will happen to God's people who stay faithful. That's what the answer to the question my daughter is asking me. What will happen? You know, we have these terms in the Adventist church. Little time of trouble. Jacob's trouble. What are God's people to do? But before we answer that, we read in Revelation chapter 13. Let me continue from verse 11. Revelation 13, 11. Let's go to 12. And he, that is the beast of the earth, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And by the way, he's also known as the false prophet. Let's turn, if we can, to Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation and uh, chapter 19. And I want to turn to Revelation 19 and verse number 20. And it says in Revelation 19 and verse 20, Then the beast was captured, and the false prophet who worked signs in his presence. See, this false prophet that it says in Revelation 19 and verse 20, who worked signs in his presence, is the same as this beast of the earth that it says in verse number 12 exercises all of the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast so obviously there's going to come a time when our country is going to join when our president is going to join when these two kingdoms are going to join together when when this kingdom, this lamb-like beast, will clasp hands, clasp hands with Rome, reach across the abyss. Now, we don't quite see it happening yet. We don't quite see it happening yet, but we have to keep in mind what the Bible is saying. And then it goes on to say, it says, whose deadly wound was healed. And then it says in verse 13, he performed great signs, okay? So he, he exercises his authority in the presence of the first beast. And it says he performed great signs, obviously, in the presence of the first beast. And that's similar language to what we see of the false prophet in Revelation 19 and verse 20. So I said the false beast is this lamb-like beast, the uh, false prophet. And it says he performed great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the presence of men. In verse 14 of Revelation 13, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs. So emphasizing the signs of the false prophet. To use the language once again of Revelation 19, 20. 
deceives. So there's going to be great deceptions. You see, God's people, if we don't study the Word of God, if you don't know the Word of God, and you're not spending time in prayer and being transformed by the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, you're not going to recognize the signs. You're not going to recognize the signs. See, this. what's wonderful about the Word of God and the study of prophecy is it enables us to not get caught up in the spirit of the age. As I mentioned, there's a lot of passions running high, but God's people have to be prayerful. We need a prayer revolution. And that connects to what I'm going to say pretty soon. We need a prayer revolution, but let me go on. Okay, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to do what? Make an image to the beast. Make an image to the beast who was wounded by the Lord and yet lived. So now this image is formed. So what are we looking toward? What was the beast? As I mentioned, the beast was an ecclesiastical, spiritual, persecuting authority. When we consider the Roman Church of the Middle Ages, when we consider the Counter-Reformation, when we consider what was going on, a spiritual assault on the Word of God, a spiritual assault on conscience. When we think of men of history like Wycliffe, like Huss and Jerome, again, read the Great Controversy, like Martin Luther, there was an attack on the essential right that God gave man, the right of conscience, the right to choose who we worship. Well, a persecuting power indeed, a persecuting religious power indeed, a persecuting ecclesiastical authority. Well, what would the image be? What would that image be of that beast? Again, a persecuting ecclesiastical authority. And so, there is going to be a formation. There is going to be a formation of a another persecuting authority. Another, well, let, let's, let, us, let us remember, and I want to put this in simple terms. If this image of the beast is formed, and if this image of the beast is obviously having the same character of the beast of the sea, then clearly we're looking at an ecclesiastical authority, but that is not exactly the same as the first, otherwise, because it's, it's, it's an image. Well, what will make up that image? What will make up that image that America, that America will play an essential role in? What is that? That is an apostate Protestant, an apostate Protestant Christian movement, a movement of other Christian groups who join together and other spiritual groups who join together. How will it happen? How will it happen? A counterfeit revival. Now, how, saints, are you going to be ready for that counterfeit revival? How are you going to be able to tell whether or not you are joining in? You see, we know from the Bible that, that Satan is called the ruler of this age. He said to, to Jesus, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the earth. You just have to bow down to me. So there must be something worldly and attractive about this counterfeit revival. But the, the key to know, the way to know how to not fall into it, is the doctrine of God. As I had mentioned before, it's the doctrine that brought us out of the dark ages. You know, Martin Luther emphasized that doctrine of righteousness by faith. It is the doctrine. It is the word of God. You have to study. You have to know the doctrine. You have to know the fundamental beliefs. And then you won't be led astray. Then you will know the difference between the true revival and the false. You see, the devil has a counterfeit. So all of these churches, all of these churches that are going to join together are churches that are going to reject biblical doctrines for the sake of unity. But there are two unities that I want to talk about. There's the unity of the Spirit. And you could read a little on Ephesians chapter 4 about that, the beginning of Ephesians chapter 4. There's the unity of the, of the Spirit, the true unity that we as God's people must have. 
and there is the counterfeit. You see, we're living in a world where people want something to happen. You see these demonstrations and protests with the George Floyd, murder of George Floyd and that terrible tragedy. People want something to happen. There is a lot of passion in the air. But how do God's people remain sound? How do we not get caught up in the passions of the age? How do we remain a peculiar people? How are we to walk by faith? How are we to have a sound mind? Satan, do you think Satan doesn't have his eye on what's going on now in this age we live in? Do you think Satan doesn't make... You, you know, the Bible says the dragon had seven heads. That means Satan has his head in everything. There's nothing going on that Satan isn't planning to use toward his end. So we as God's people have to remain sound in mind and study the Word of God. That is why I have been repeatedly emphasizing prayer. 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 If the true unity that we seek is the unity of the Spirit and not a counterfeit, it is not going to happen without prayer. They, the apostles prayed for a period of time. The disciples prayed for a certain amount of days and until they received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit, the latter rain, you know, we have the former rain and we're going to have the latter rain. The church was started with the former rain is going to be the latter rain. And the true revolution that we need is the, 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 the latter rain revolution to bring this gospel message to the close. We're not going to bring the gospel message to a close without a full spiritual internal revival of individuals. You know, something Ellen White said was that secret prayer is the lifeblood of the soul. We each as individuals need to have a secret prayer revival. We need to have a prayer revival to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to have an internal revival. People want to change the laws in, in regards to this situation of, of George Floyd. There are those who want to see re, uh, legal reform and structural reform. And it is good to seek reforms. Praise God in the past, for example. Well, it depends what those reforms are, but I'm speaking in a general sense. I'm, in a very general sense, it is good to seek godly reforms, legally speaking. They can make a great difference. For example, in the past, when slavery was made illegal, praise God, that was a godly reform. It makes a difference. But let us not forget that ancient Israel had the perfect laws. They had the prophet Moses as the law giver. They had the perfect structure. They had all of those things, and they still fell into corruption because the law can't change the heart. Let me ask you something. When, as far as church history was concerned, when was the church the most pure? When was the church the most pure? What was the dominant legal system and structure where the church grew and was most pure? When? Rome, a corrupt government with corrupt laws, a corrupt structure, systematic abuse, you want to use a term of the modern age, systematic racism, all of those things were fully in place and nobody could challenge them. In fact, if anybody did what they're doing today, demonstrating against the government, what do you think would have happened in those days? And yet at the same time, yet at the same time, the church was the most pure. Now again, I'm, I, we should always seek good reform. We should always seek those things. But just as a reminder, again, ancient Israel had perfect laws. Ancient Israel had the perfect lawgiver. And there was abuse. And there was corruption. You see, if a person is not surrendered to God, no matter how good the laws are, Evil will thrive. The Pharisees found ways to twist the law. And a person who is surrendered to God, like those early Christians, no matter how corrupt the, the law is, they will find a way to emulate the love of God. 
through the leading of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible is very clear that there, that Satan has his eye on everything. And when we see the things that are going on in the world today, do not think that that is not something that Satan is going to work with as well to lead to the scenario that we see in Revelation 13. What does Satan have proposed for us? What does Satan have planned for the world? Let's continue in Revelation 13. Well, there's going to be a counterfeit revival. Oh, my brothers and sisters, there are going to be people who are going to say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to join hand in hand with one another. We need to put aside our differences. We need to put aside our doctrinal differences. We need to join hands. There's going to be a counterfeit revival. Yes, we see that. And if you as God's person will say, no, I can't join with that. There's something a little off. There's so I, I got, I, my discernment is telling me something's wrong there. You're going to be targeted. You're going to be targeted. They will say to you, don't you want to make this world a better place? You want stand up. And you're going to have pressure put upon you. There's going to be a counterfeit revival. The Bible is telling us that. The Bible is clear, brothers and sisters. We have to have a sound mind. We know that there's going to be a true unity. There's going to be false unity. Jesus said the church should be one. The Bible tells us there's to be neither Greek nor Jew, bond nor free, woman nor man. You know what that means? That's the same like saying in today's world, there's neither black nor white. In other words, ethnically, for the Jewish mind, that's as far as you can get, Greek and Jew. And the Bible is saying they're all one in Christ. Woman nor man. Now, let us make a difference between the unity of God and the unity of Satan. There's a counterfeit. See, the unity of Satan is sameness. The destruction of variety. But God is a God of variety. So when the Bible says there's neither going to be Greek nor Jew, bond nor free, woman nor man. Let me focus in on the woman and man part. The Bible is not saying that there's going to be confusion of gender roles. The Bible is not saying man will not be the head of the house. The Bible says man is to be the head of the house. But the unity, the true unity happens when the variety the variety of God's people, the, the variety that he gives us. You know, he gives each one of us a different gift, for example, in the church. And when we look at that language in the book of Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12, this unity of the body of Christ, what do we see there? We, we see that there are many parts, one body, but they're each distinct. They each have a distinct. See, what that is the harmony. The true unity is not to say we're all going to be the same. And all of our uniqueness, all of the beauty that God gave to each individual, there's something beautiful about men. There's something beautiful about women. There's something beautiful about being a deacon. There's something beautiful about being a pastor. There's something beautiful about having the gift of hospitality. God is not, God is a God of variety. He created a universe of variety. He created a universe, He created a world where some people have blue eyes, some have brown eyes, some have dark skin, some have light skin. The true variety. But how does it happen when our identity is in Christ? Look at the language, Galatians 3.28, neither Greek nor Jew, bond nor free, woman or man, all are one in Christ. The true unity happens when Christ becomes our ultimate identity and we do not fall into these lower identities to the point, to the point where they become barriers between us because the Holy Spirit is a barrier breaker. The Holy Spirit broke the language barriers in the day of Pentecost. True unity comes from the Holy Spirit. True unity. Now again, there's going to be a counterfeit revival. There's going to be a counterfeit unity. Let's go further. Let's look at Revelation now, the verse I mentioned. What is going to happen here? Revelation, well, let's go to verse 15 first. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. So, the beast of the earth, the beast of the earth would give power. He would be granted the power. He would be granted this ability to give breath to the image of the beast, to this false apostate Protestant image, union, that comes about through this false... And look at breath. You know, the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says all scripture is God-breathed. Jesus breathed on the, on the apostles, signifying the reception of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. 
But the Holy Spirit is also related to the wind, also related to life, a new life. We, we, we have a new life when we receive the Holy Spirit. And we could talk of breath, but we see this false breath. We see this false, you know, God's people have to discern the spirits. And so it says, he was granted the power to give breath. It was a false spiritual revival to the image of the beast, to bring it alive. False counterfeit revival is going to happen. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Again, violation of a basic constitutional principle. The First Amendment guarantees freedom of religion. So America is going to turn away from basic constitutional principles. So what are we going to see? We're going to see the Pope joining hands with the president. We're going to see an attack on these constitutional principles. The basic one, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience is going to be attacked. There's going to be pressure to join into this counterfeit revival. See, Satan works by pressure. Satan works by force. The Bible tells us in the book of Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing. God's people will be anxious for nothing. It's the Holy Spirit. Read Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Make your requests known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will do what? Guard your heart. How will our heart be guarded? Through the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of prayer, who does not work by force. See, Jesus knocks at the door. He doesn't kick the door down. He doesn't kick. He doesn't say, you become a Christian. Oh, I'm going to threaten you and I'm going to demonize you and I'm going to label you and I'm going to categorize you. Those are the things that were going on during the French Revolution, the reign of terror. Anybody, there were kangaroo courts set in place. There was chaos and anybody suspected of going against the revolution. Oh, brother, if you were, and that's the time where, that's the time that is upon us. People may question you. If you are a person of God, and they might say, why are you not joining this movement? Why are you not joining this counterfeit? They're not going to call it a counterfeit. They're going to say, why are you not joining this, you, this great ecumenical movement? And you will be an outcast. Just make sure you're an outcast for his name's sake and not for any other reason. Make sure if you're an outcast, you're an outcast because you stood for what was right. You didn't lean on your own understanding. You didn't present your own opinion. If somebody has a problem with you because you spoke the word of God and they don't like it, that's between them and God. Don't worry about it. If you're an outcast, you know, you got to choose your battles, but ultimately you got to let Jesus fight your battles. And then it says in verse 16, he causes all. Now, I'm going to, I want to dwell on this and I'm going to close. I'll close, I promise, in five minutes. I'm going to close in five minutes. Maybe less. 12.19 now, according to my clock, I'm going to close very less. But, but please do not think that because I'm going to speak in such a short, finalize this point in a short way, that it's not important. Look at verse 16. He causes all. Now the Bible is saying all. So the beast of the earth, for the sake of glorifying the beast of the sea in this false union, it's saying will cause all. It's not saying only those in America. It's not saying only those in Europe. It's saying all. And it says he causes all. And then it describes that all in three terms, in three ways, both Small and great. Now, when you think of small and great, the Bible is talking about authority. For example, in the days of Jonah, everybody from the greatest to the least repented. When Jonah went out and said, Nineveh is going to receive the judgment of God, there was a great revival. From greatest to the least, the king of Nineveh. Everybody. So, the first category is authority. So, we are seeing all... First, in terms of authority, small and great. It doesn't matter whether you're the president of the United States, or it doesn't matter whether you're a street cleaner. Everybody equally is going to have to receive this mark. Number two, rich and poor, rich and poor. 
economic. So the first, authoritative, authority. Second, economy. Doesn't matter whether you're rich, doesn't matter whether you're poor. Everybody, all across the board, all across the board, all, all, keep that word in mind, will be asked to join this false spiritual revival and in part and connection, in direct connection with that, to receive a counterfeit law, to receive a counterfeit gospel, to receive a counterfeit Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath, the Bible says the Sabbath was a sign. And and the word mark here really is like a seal, but a man-made seal. The, the Greek word is charagma. So a man-made seal of authority. You see, the law of God, the Sabbath, was a seal. And in the Bible, a seal and a sign are are the same. Look at Romans 4.11 to see that connection. Circumcision was also a sign in the flesh, but it's also a sign and a seal. Romans 4.11. So a sign is a seal. The law was to be on the head and the forehead and on the hand. The Bible tells us the law of God, the word of God was to be on the forehead, on the hand. This mark, this counterfeit. Well, if the law of God is to be on the hand or on the forehead, if the Sabbath was a sign, which is part of the law, well, then, and if the word of God was to be on the hand or the forehead, then clearly you've got to know the doctrine to receive the seal of God. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that seals God's people. How do I know that? Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30. What does Ephesians 4.30 well, if the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, and we want if, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, the unity of the Holy Spirit, well, how does it happen? Ephesians 4 and verse 30. And what does it tell us there? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. So we're going to either have the seal of the Holy Spirit or we're going to have the mark of the beast. People are going to be pressured to join that counterfeit revival. They're going to be, and, and what is going to happen next? Is your job in jeopardy, saint? Have you spoken things from the word of God? Are you afraid to speak from the word of God because you think you might lose your job? See, God doesn't work that way. God doesn't work by force, but, but Satan does. And what is going to happen here? We see economy, rich and poor, and then liberty, free and slave. So we see three categories, authority, economy, liberty, e authority, economy, liberty. So whether you have a lot of authority or little, whether you have, whether you have a lot of money or little, whether you have a lot of freedom or little, this is the counterfeit union that Satan has his mind on, the counterfeit unity. See, there's a true unity of the spirit, there's the false unity. This is what is, the world is, is headed toward. And we have to be prepared. How are we to be prepared as God's people? The Holy Spirit, who is a spirit of prayer. As the Word of God tells us, we don't even know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with sighs that are too deep for words, and God who reads the heart knows the mind of the spirit, who intercedes on behalf of the saints in accordance with the will of God. See, God's church, God's end-time church, have to be a church of prayer and self-assessment, self-study. We, You know, the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement was a time where the individuals of ancient Israel had to afflict their souls. Afflict their, not afflict someone else's soul, afflict their souls. They had to investigate themselves. And we are living in the day of atonement, the heavenly day of atonement. For those who have studied the sanctuary, you know that. You know the court is seated and the books are open, Revelation 7.10. You know what that means. And you know it means that God's people have to investigate themselves prayerfully. We have to investigate ourselves. We have to surrender ourselves. We have to open ourselves for the reform of the Holy Spirit. You know, a wonderful movie years ago, Jesus of Nazareth, the character of John the Baptist said, 
before kingdoms change, men must change. And there's that song by Michael Jackson. Again, I'm, I'm not here to talk about Michael Jackson. I'm not here to uphold Michael Jackson. This isn't about Michael Jackson. But he has a song called Man in the Mirror. Doesn't Some of you might know that song. And it says, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. I'm asking you to change his ways. And no message is going to get any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. And that is the investigative judgment mentality. When we have that humble attitude, and not the attitude that Adam had when Adam had sinned, what did Adam do? Did he blame, did, God gave him the chance to give an account, to be accountable. And God is giving us all that chance. But what did Adam do? He, no, he blamed God. He said, no, it's a woman. You did it, God. You gave me this woman. It's the woman who led me astray. What did the woman do? She blamed the serpent. They didn't take account. God's people, the mature church, who it truly experiences the unity of the body of Christ and not the counterfeit unity that Satan has planned for us, the mature church, guess what they're going to do? They're going to be humble. We're going to be humble. We're going to surrender to this inner transformation. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because the reality is, the reality is that there is persecution coming for God's people. But there is also a revival, a true revival coming and a true experience. You see, that's the interesting thing. If it comes to that point and you are experiencing economic confusion or you are being persecuted or you are in turmoil because you've stood up for the word of God, Guess what you'll have that nobody else who isn't doing that will have? You'll have true freedom. You see, we were designed by God to be free. And one aspect of the great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been unfolding throughout the ages is a battle over freedom. And Jesus says, you shall Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let me close with a prayer. I think I went a little longer than I said, but I'm going to close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God. Praise your name. Praise your name, Heavenly Father, for your word. It is only through the study of your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, that we can have true freedom, that we can have the peace that surpasses all understanding, that we can have a sound mind, that we can have the true unity. We need to be a praying church, Heavenly Father. We need to have a revival of prayer like those disciples did before they received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need to turn back to prayer. Heavenly Father, I read somewhere or, or I heard it was the case that when the Civil War was going on in this country, that the Adventist Church had a period of fasting and prayer. The Civil War had went on for years before they called for that fasting and prayer. And then finally, after that period of deep fasting and prayer, not long after that, the war ended. Lord, we now are awaiting the outpouring of your Holy Spirit and the only revival that can really make a difference in this end time. Heavenly Father, so much more. Do we need to take an investigative look at our own lives and ask ourselves the question, how is my prayer life? How is my prayer life? How is my relationship with you, Lord God? Am I surrendering all my passions Am I surrendering all the things I feel strongly about? Let, let, let us come to you, Lord God, and, and let us take a look one thing after another, the things that are bothering us, the things that are stirring our hearts, the things that we want to talk about, the things that we want to think about, all of those things, Lord. Let us come to you and surrender all those things to you. Let us pray to you. Let us have a self-investigative judgment during this time of the anti-typical Day of Atonement. We want to have the true revival that we need to demonstrate as a church the oneness. Because right now, Heavenly Father, we're not doing that. But that's what we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.